Welcome to Searching the Scriptures, presented by The Church of Christ. Your speaker is Brother James D. MacDonald, Evangelist. I found, now Christ liveth in me. We ask you to get your Bibles and study along with us. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly or thoroughly furnished unto all our every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. A hearty welcome and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we welcome you to another Searching the Scriptures telecast. We are so appreciative of you tuning in each week and listening and viewing the things that we have to say. And we trust you'll get your Bible and pencil and paper and jot down the things that we say that you might investigate and make sure and certain we're teaching those things found in the pages of inspiration, that grand old book that we call the Bible, God's Holy and Righteous Will. We want to express our appreciation to the management of this TV station for their kindness, their expertise, and the professional way in which they handle these programs, and we are enjoying immensely preaching the unsearchable riches of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and know we have a good television audience, and we've had telephone calls, and we welcome you to call us. The 800 number, of course, will be on the screen. Feel free to call us at any time. We'll do our best to get right back with you, if it's not immediately. And we will search the Scriptures, as the Bible says, John 5, 39, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. And John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John chapter 8 and verse 32. The Bible is the standard that will judge us all in the last and final day, and it's the Bible that we need to be studying in this present day as we travel from time to eternity in our fast decaying bodies, and as we head for that silent city of the dead, better known as the cemetery. And you know it is a silent city of the dead because we haven't talked to anybody from there lately, have we? That's why it's the silent city of the dead. One day, it'll be the living city of the dead because the resurrection will take place and we will have a new body and we will look forward to being in a new city, a new home, a new wonderful place called heaven. That city whose foundation and builder and maker is God. This mortal must put on immortality. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We thank God for his death his burial and resurrection from the dead, and his exaltation and coronation and magnification at God's own right hand. And we know as Christians we're in heavenly places in Christ Jesus our Lord. We want to talk to all of us, beginning with me and going right out to you and this intelligent audience, about a subject, a brief introduction to the Bible. Now, the reason we say brief is because the short period of time that we have here on this program, we'll just begin to get into many facets and phases of the Bible, God's holy word. So it will be a brief introduction to the Bible. We want to do this program to show us the greatness of the Bible, the beauty of the Bible, and the joy we have to study and to ponder and meditate from these letters from heaven revealed in this book that we call the Bible. You know, the Bible is the greatest book that's ever been written. And to lead into this program today, I have something I want to read that I think will be of interest to you and to all of us. And you know, the Pony Express was the first Western mail service in the early days of America. It ran from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California, a distance of 1,900 miles. The trip was made on horseback in only 10 days. Forty men, each riding 50 miles a day, dashed along the trail on 500 strong horses. To conserve weight, only small men were employed. Clothing was very light, saddles were small and thin, and no weapon was carried, even though Indian country was nearby and as they traveled. The horses themselves wore small shoes or none at all. The mail pouches were flat and conservative in size. 
letters were written on thin paper and postage was, are you ready for this? $5 per ounce. A high price now, but a king's ransom then. And yet, my friends, each writer carried a full-sized Bible. That's exactly right. You heard me correctly. Each writer carried a full-sized Bible. The Bible is the indispensable companion for a complete life. It really is like carrying a whole library in one volume. Think how important they knew the Bible was as they rode on horseback with a Pony Express. It means even more to us now to think about the Pony Express and know they regarded the Word of God as being the most valuable possession they had. Even though it weighed a lot compared to what they were carrying otherwise, they made sure every rider had access to a full-size Bible. The Bible contains approximately 3,566,480 letters, 773,746 words, 1,189 chapters and 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, 31,102 verses. The average word in the Bible contains few or less than five simple letters. What a lesson for the man, group of men, or individuals who have a vocabulary for big words. Then we could honestly say the Bible is a book of simplicity. Let me clarify what I mean by a book of simplicity. Everything you need to know and understand to become a Christian is simple as ABC. Who is it that cannot understand, hear the gospel, believe it, repent of every sin, confess Christ publicly before men, and be buried with your Lord in baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost for the remission of your sins, and in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2 and verse 38. Who is it that cannot understand to do that to become a Christian? That's a simple thing to do. And for some reason we cannot understand the plan of salvation, we'll go to heaven with the babies because they're S-A-F-E, because they never have been lost, you see, because they've not reached the age of accountability. And so God takes care of those who are not able to comprehend nor understand. But of course, when the babies reach the age of accountability and grow up and begin to mature, they'll be held accountable when they reach that age and must obey the gospel or then be lost. And so we have the opportunity to hear, believe, and obey the gospel. We can understand that. It is simple and elementary as A, B, C. As the old fellow says, it's simple as falling off a log, isn't it? We can comprehend that. We can understand that. And we can tell others the simple plan of salvation. Everything that we need to know and understand to be a faithful Christian and go to heaven is also simple. Now granted, there's portions of the book of Romans, the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, the book of Ezekiel, because it talks about the wheel and the wheel and things that we will never figure out. We know God's ways as far as understanding everything. The Bible says God's ways are past finding out. But we don't have to know everything about the Bible and in the Bible to become a Christian. We just got to know that we're lost without God and without hope. And we must yield our will to God's will. And God makes it simple as ABC in a step-by-step -step process, telling us what we need to do to come to Him through and by the simple plan of salvation He has made possible through the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. So everything we need to know and understand to live the faithful Christian life is very simple in the Bible. When we become a Christian, as we begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth, 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11 tells us exactly what we need to be doing. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. That means increase. That's a plus. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And a knowledge temperance and temperance patience. And a patience godliness and a god God in his brotherly kindness, and the brotherly kindness charity. Peter said, If these things be in you and abound, the word abound means to be actively engaged in or involved in the Lord's work. If these things be in you and abound, they make you. You should be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he's been purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things ye shall never fall. And so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Friends and neighbors, brothers and sisters in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, 
That's describing the time we step off on that beautiful shore in that city whose foundation and builder and maker is God. In 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Heaven is the home of the soul. And that's what we're looking forward to as we travel down here below in this life. And so the Bible is a book of simplicity. Everything we need to know and understand to go to heaven when this life is over, if we'll apply ourselves and grow in the grace and knowledge of the truth, 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. The Bible must be rightly divided and respected. In 2 Timothy 2, 15, the Apostle Paul penned these words. He said, study, that's a command, not an option. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. To rightly divide the word means to handle or write the word of truth. It means to harmonize all the Bible together. It means to take all the verses and put them together in perspective and come up with one harmonious arrangement and agreement. Any time that we take one verse against another verse, we are wrongly dividing the word instead of rightly dividing the word. And of course, rightly dividing the word will cause us to grow and to develop and mature spiritually. Wrongly dividing the word will cause us to misapply, twist, take out of context, and take out of the proper place as God has designed it through the power of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. 2 Peter 1, 21, The prophecy came not in old time with the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so we see the beauty of the revelation of the book that we call the Bible. We must understand the different ages or dispensations of time in the Bible. The beginning age of time is the patriarchal age. The word patriarch means father and the word archal means rule. It's the age of the time of when God spoke orally, verbally, and directly to man. Now listen very carefully. This was the age of no written, recorded revelation that we have record of. Notice I didn't say it was the age of no revelation, but I did say it's the age of no written revelation. So it was written down later, but at that particular time it was just orally and verbally and direct God speaking through His great men at that time. And this age of time, when no written recorded revelation that we know of is recorded in the Bible, this was about 2,500 years of Bible history, the introductory period of time. This was a family system of religion when the fathers spoke to their families and to their children and taught them the principles God had taught them as being the head of the family. So this 2,500 year period was this family worship time or family system of religion. And we could identify this age as the starlight age of time. You know, the stars and the moon and the sun are all three great lights in the Bible. Stars were very dim in comparison to the moon, and the moon was dim in comparison to the sun. And so light would begin to be revealed in the patriarchal age or family system of religion. It was very dim and far off as God began to fulfill His eternal promises down through the stream of time. And so this was the starlight age or beginning age of Time. Then, of course, was implemented the Law of Moses, which is a national religion. It was the religion of the nation of Israel. So we come from a family religion, a family system, to a national system of religion to the children of Israel. This is the first time that the Bible was recorded in written form, that is, a portion of the Bible, the Ten Commandments were written on tables of stone by the hand of Almighty God. He called Moses upon the mountain, and he stayed there with him forty days and forty nights. Now think how devoted Moses must have been. Just to go up there and stay with God forty days and forty nights was a tremendous honor. God didn't allow everybody in His presence. You know, they had to stay back away from the mountain as it began to thunder and to begin to roar, and the power of God was demonstrated. And so he picked Moses of all people to come up on that mountain with him and to receive those Ten Commandments written on table of stone. And then when Moses got back down, uh, his brother Aaron and the people there were 
were already disobeying some of those very commands on the tables of stone. Moses was enraged as they had erected a golden calf. They had melted down their jewelry and had made a golden calf and were worshiping that golden calf. And the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make to thee any graven image. Moses was angry and with good reason. He went back up again for 40 days and 40 nights to be there with God on the mountain. And so this was a national law written to the children of Israel, the first written recorded revelation that we have record of. This would be typified by the moonlight age of time. This might be a particular interest to the children because they can learn the starlight and the moonlight. And this was an age of about 1,500 years of Bible history. And then came the law of Christ. Galatians 6 tells us, Bear you one of those burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This ushered in a international law. This applied to all human beings of all races and around the globe. First it was a family system for 2,500 years, and then it was a national system for about 1,500 years. Now here we are in the law of Christ, 2012. It's for the whole world. And as the Bible says, He commissioned His apostles in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He said, All power hath been given unto me, both in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And I am the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even to the end of the world. In Mark 16, 15 and 16, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It's easy to see how it came from the family system to the national system to an international worldwide system. Go teach all nations, go into all the world. This had not been so until the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a marvelous thing to think about this global gospel that was for the whole entire human race. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter stood up and opened his mouth said, The truth I perceive, which means to understand or to know that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, not just the Jewish nation as it had been under the law of Moses, but in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. In fact, if you flip back over the 10th chapter of the book of Matthew, you find that Jesus told them, Go preach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go ye not the way of the Gentiles, in the house of the Samaritans enter ye not. So you see, it was a limited commission, only the house of Israel at that time, but now it's an unlimited commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And thank God we're in that age and dispensation of time when all of humanity is included, and none of humanity is excluded from God's Word, because God is no respecter of persons in every nation. He that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And on that great day of Pentecost, when the first gospel sermon was preached, after the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the Spirit came as a sound of rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting, clothed and dung to fear them with fire, and set upon each of them. That is them, the antecedent referring to the apostles. And in, the, uh, in verse 36, the apostle Peter brought his sermon to a focus. He said, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, we better stop and see what it's there for. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in heart, and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and all those that are far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call, many of the word did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. They that gladly received his word were baptized. You know why they weren't any more baptized that day? They weren't any more gladly received his word. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day, he didn't say a week or two later, a month later, or six months later, the same day, there was added to them about 3,000 souls. He didn't say 3,000, but he did say about 3,000. And they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine, in fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers, reading through verse 42. Now come on down to verse 47, the clincher, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. 
Now you see, not a single person joined the church of their choice. The Lord did the saving. The Lord did the adding. You know, anything you can join is human. You can join the union. You can join the Lions Club. You can join the Kiwanis Club. You can join this and you can join that. But you don't join the Lord's church. He adds you to it when you submit your will to His will. We need to yield our will to God's will. He gave the message through the apostles of the power of the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. The message was preached, and Peter told them what they needed to do. And when they obeyed the voice of Peter through the revelation of Jesus Christ and the apostles, they were added to the church that Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build, Matthew 16 and 18. I say also to the power of Peter, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It was a promise in Matthew 16 and 18. It was a fruition or fulfillment of that promise in Acts chapter 2. In Acts 20, 28, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock, which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. What is the church of God in this context? Well, who purchased the church with his own blood? Was it God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost? Well, the context, the verses before, after, and surrounding, and an immediate text shows that he had reference to Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. You mean, Brother MacDonald, you think Jesus was God? Well, of course, don't you? Do you read your Bible? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Now watch this word, Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now what was that Word? Well, John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, the Redeemer, our Lord, our Master, our High Priest, our King, and soon to be our Judge, but He's now our Savior. And so Jesus purchased the church with His blood. It's the price of His blood that He bought the church with. Now when people start throwing off on the church and say, you don't have to be a member of the church, and so on and so forth, they just don't understand what they're saying. They just don't understand what the Bible says. Anything that's important enough for Jesus Christ to shed His blood for on the cross is important. It's imperative that we exemplify and point out the beauty of the cross of Christ, and you couldn't have the cross without Jesus and have any meaning. You see, His death, His burial, and resurrection from the dead. So He purchased the church with His own blood. He bought it. He paid for it. He gave His life. He gave His blood. Obviously, it is very important to the Lord, and it ought to be very important to you and I. And if we say the church has no place, the church has no meaning, we don't have to be in the church to be saved or to obey God. We just have not read our Bibles and, and meditated on what the Bible has to say. In Ephesians 5 and 23, he, he's the head of the body, the church, you see. He's the head of the body of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, the church is the body, and the body is the church, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. He says, endeavoring to get the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one Spirit. Even if you're called to one hope, you're called to one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and one Father of all is above all, through all, and in you all. Now, he is, he is the Savior of the body. The church is the body, and the body is the church. How can we possibly be saved if we're outside the body that he, he is the Savior of? So if we want to be saved, we've got to be in the body of which Christ is the Savior that He bought and paid for on the cross of Calvary. We know He bought and paid for the church, and the price was His own blood. And that's why the plan of salvation is so simple to hear that message of the gospel, Romans 10, 17. To believe it with all your heart, John 8, 24. And to repent of every single sin, Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30, Acts 2, 38, Acts 11, 18. A change of mind, a change of will, and lead you to a change of life when you truly repent. And then to make that good confession, like the eunuch in Acts 8, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down the water, and Philip baptized him. And they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, the eunuch saw no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. At what point did the eunuch rejoice? When he believed, when he made the confession, or when he come up out of the watery grave of baptism? Just connect it together, and you can see he went on his way rejoicing because he knew he had been risen with Christ 
and he was now a child of God, a Christian, a citizen of the kingdom, a servant of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He was now a member of that royal priesthood, that holy nation, a peculiar people, because he had been called out of darkness into Christ's marvelous light. And so we see the beauty of obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian and growing in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 3, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, and that where I am, there you may be also. Let me appeal to all of us to study and meditate upon our Bibles and do that which the Bible says to do and don't do those things the Bible does not say to do. Make sure we have the book, the chapter, the verse to back up everything we say and do in religion. Remember this book, the Bible, will be opened in that last day so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God, Romans 14 and 12. And we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and answer the deeds done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. And in verse 11, Paul emphasizes, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And the gospel is God's power to save. We must continue to preach the gospel because that's the only power of persuasion we have to reach men and women, boys and girls, Bring them to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The Bible is right. The Bible is true. Let's stand firm and foursquare upon the word of the living God because it will judge us in that last and final day. Are we ready to meet the Lord? Yield our will, please, to His will that we might be saved eternally and step off on that beautiful shore in that city of heaven. Our time is up. Thank you for yours. Goodbye, friends. It's been such a wonderful opportunity to be with you here on the Searching the Scriptures today, as always, and we would like to hear from you. If you have Bible questions, you can write to us here at the address on the screen, or you can call the 800 number, and we'd just be glad to study with you, investigate the Bible with you further, and any time we have the opportunity. You know, the Bible is that wonderful book that we all enjoy studying together, and help us to have a desire, a hunger, and a thirst after righteousness, as the Bible says, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we will be filled. Let us have that eternal spiritual appetite to drink in God's Word and to absorb as much of the teaching as we can while we have the time and while we have the opportunity. Buy the truth and sell it not. Help us not to compromise God's Word, but to submit our will to His will, knowing that eternity is forever that we need to yield our will to His eternal will before it's eternally and everlastingly too late. Once Searching the Scriptures has been brought to you by The Church of Christ. For questions, comments, or a free Bible correspondence course, write Brother James D. MacDonald, 88 Hoover Road, Woodbury, Tennessee, 37190, or call toll-free at 877-222-8818. Join us next Sunday for Searching the Scriptures. Oh, oh, what a salvation.